All right, so uh, I have learning objectives, uh, but what I wanna talk to you about is I want to uh, first just do a quick primer on health information exchange to level set, since some of you uh, are may not be as familiar with it as uh, those in the center who study it, and then talk about a couple of works in progress that I have going on and kind of a new direction that's kind of coming out of this work that I would love feedback on. Um, so first, since this is our 50th anniversary, I dug up this slide. How many of you remember this slide from Clem McDonald? This is Dr. McDonald's slide that he used to illustrate the importance of health information exchange, right? Which he talked about the patient's journey through the healthcare system, and they touch all these different places, and they're all kind of data silos unto themselves. So I dug that up from our repository. Um, and so that's why a lot of us are interested in studying health information exchange is because it fundamentally has an opportunity to improve uh, communication and health care outcomes. Um, so uh, as some of you know, I have, uh, I, I love HIE so much. I wrote a book about it um, and edited a book about it with a number of folks at the Institute. Um, HIE is, is both a verb and a noun. So we often here tend to think of it as a noun because of the Indiana Health Information Exchange. That's an organization that facilitates the verb form of health information exchange. But HIE itself is an action in which we are exchanging electronically information or data between two healthcare system actors. So we often think about this as clinician to clinician, right? That's the first thing that pops in our head, but it could be uh, these days uh, clinician to public health, which is where I spend a lot of my time, or from public health to clinician, or um, maybe it's from clinical organization to community-based organization, or maybe it is from, uh, you know, clinician to health insurance company or ACO or some other entity in the healthcare system. So I'm interested in studying and do study both the verb and the noun forms because I think both are important and necessary to achieve uh, the ultimate goal of ensuring that uh, clinicians and other members of a patient's healthcare team, including caregivers, have complete access right to that longitudinal medical record for that person so they can make the best decisions possible. And at the population level, we can aggregate data to make the best decisions possible possible about policy and community-based interventions. So most of the literature uh, around health information exchange uh, usage, which is what I'm going to talk about today, focuses on the concept of adoption. So I'm going to pick on Josh because he's not here, uh, but this is uh, from one of Josh's most recent studies around the adoption of health information exchange. And you can see that a lot of times we look at adoption of HIE over time. This is hospital adoption, both Intra HIE, which is sharing data between, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the ED and the laboratory or the ED and an outpatient facility within the same network like IU Health um, and inter HIE or inter organizational HIE, which is sharing it between, say, Eskenazi and St. Vincent. And so you can see that over time, HIE adoption has increased. The source of data for a lot of these adoption studies is the self reported data from the American Hospital Association. So they have an IT supplement that they give to hospitals. And this is where the hospital raises its hand. And says, yes, we engage in this kind of activity. However, it doesn't really tell you any of the details, right? So I'm interested in what I call the continuum of HIE research and development, which spans from the availability of, hey, IHI has launched a new uh, operational service that's available in the community for hospitals to subscribe to. And then hospitals can raise their hand and adopt that new service. But then how is it used? Who's using it? For what purposes? And then ultimately what we want to get to is what is the impact of using that service on some tangible outcome, whether that be at the patient level or at a workflow level or at an organizational level? So my recent work has really been focused around this concept of usage, right, which is the real uh, kind of use of health information exchange to facilitate some kind of clinical decision making or organizational decisions. So 
the first study that we have ongoing uh, ends in August uh, is an R21 from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, where we are taking actual user logs from the IMPC network of clinicians who've logged in and used it um, across ED, uh, inpatient, and, and outpatient. We're going to focus a little bit in on the ED encounters in this particular study, but we've been looking at what is the actual usage, like who out of all the encounters that are in the IMPC, what proportion um, did did a clinician actually use CareWeb, which is the kind of portal uh, for clinicians to use to look at the longitudinal medical record? And our primary aims were to sort of quantify this and look at factors associated with usage. So um, in our first kind of look at usage over time, uh, we see a couple of things. One is, so this spans from 2011, uh, quarter one, all the way to the end of 2017. And we can see that generally speaking, usage increased over time. However, overall, it's really around 5% which actually lines up with the extant literature, which tells us that in most HIEs that have been studied in New York and other places, it usage is typically less than 10% of encounters. And so in that regard, uh, it lines up. However, increase, uh, it has increased over time. The other thing we notice from the graph is there's this yellow blip right here uh, from 2012. And then the other thing is, is that the blue line really sort of took off around the uh, 2014 time frame um, and then leveled out a little bit and then bumped up again um, around 2016, I believe. Uh, so end of 2015 into 2016. Um, and the yellow line is, is, is has remained relatively flat. Green has also gone up. Green here is ER, blue is inpatient, and yellow is outpatient. And so you might say, well, why are these blips? What are these blips? So we've started to look into that. Um, the first one is when Eskenazi did a pilot where the clinicians in the outpatient setting could see the prescription drug monitoring program data um, from the state that was available to them for about a year in a pilot uh, that JT Fennell and others worked on with the MITRE Corporation. So when they did that pilot, usage of CareWeb spiked. People were going there to look at the PDMP data. Um, then the state came back and said, nope, shut that down. We don't know why you clinicians would want to look at this through IHI. Instead, you have to log in separately through our own thing to view the data. And so subsequently, the CareWeb uh, usage went down um, proportionally, right, all the way back to the same level. And uh, clinicians were then yet using that third system to look at data specifically for controlled substances. The other spike happened uh, just after IHI launched a uh, single sign-on to CareWeb. So this is where inside of Cerner or Epic or whatever EHR the clinicians are using, uh, they can click right from there into CareWeb, it automatically logs them into CareWeb and brings them into the context of that same patient. And so when that happened, you should spike. Um, now it did level off though. And so, um, but we see that there are some external stimuli that can help kind of boost HIE usage in these couple of examples. In addition to the quantitative assessment, we also have an arm that's looking qualitatively at HIE usage, and we've been doing one-on-one -on -one interviews with clinicians um, in the ED setting uh, across our partners in the IMPC. And then we've really been asking them questions about their awareness and use of CareWeb and their meth other methods for obtaining outside information. We currently uh, are, are doing the coding of that and analysis uh, is under underway as well. So it's truly a work in progress. Similarly, over at the VA, um, I have a study that also ends in August where we've been uh, implementing an HIE-based intervention that alerts VA clinicians when their patients receive acute care services outside VA. So this is for primary care teams um, that are looking at it. And we did a randomized controlled trial uh, to look at the impact of that intervention uh, with my uh, co-investigator, Ken Bookfar, who's a geriatrician at the Bronx VA. Um, in that, what happens is that when we receive an alert uh, from IHI that a patient has had an acute care event outside the VA, we offer a note inside of CPRS, which is the VA's 
electronic medical record system. And it goes to the care team. The PAC team is what we call them in the VA. That's their kind of integrated primary care team. And the care team receives a note about the outside event and has information on which hospital they were admitted to or which ED they visited and what the chief complaint was or the primary diagnosis. Um, and uh, and then uh, kind of directs them to use the VA's uh, internal portal that can see IHI data. Uh, and, and then it has to be signed off on by the care team there at the VA. Similarly, uh, we've been examining uh, the implementation of that qualitatively with one-on-one -on -one interviews in both the Bronx VA and the Indianapolis VA with questions, again, focusing on awareness of HIE alerts and the methods for obtaining outside non-VA, in this context, non-VA information about their patients. And we're currently going through that. And so as, I, as I've been reading through all of these node reports and qualitative uh, you know, transcripts, um, it struck me that we might be able to develop archetypes for health information exchange use. And that's what I want to talk about today. Um, so what is an archetype? Right. So some of you might be so I'm not going to talk about the Jungian archetypes of, of human existence. Right. Uh, but I love those names. So, you know, there's the lover and there's the magician and there's the ruler. And I thought, couldn't we come up with some cool names like that for health information exchange? Right. So we can label clinicians as like, you know, the HIE lover. Right. Um, so. Uh, so these are some other examples of, of archetypes. There's archetype, right? We're familiar with uh, story archetypes of characters in science fiction or other genres, et cetera. So that's what I want to try to be able to get to with, with HIE. And as I read through the transcripts, um, I've come up with a preliminary list. And so I would love your feedback. So these are six archetypes that I see as kind of emerging from some of the uh, reviews that I've been doing of the, of the data. So the first First one is, uh, I, you know, in, in Jungian terms, there's the common man, right, archetype. So I was like, well, is the common HIE user, but I really want to, or routine, but I'm like, that's kind of boring. So I love a kind of, kind of jazzier title if you have one. Um, I'm going to talk about the more common ones here in a second. Um, some of the less common ones, the delegator. Sometimes we would ask, say, a physician or a nurse practitioner, you know, how do you find outside information? And they're like, oh, I sort of delegate that right to a, to a nurse uh, RN or an MA or someone. So there's that one's kind of straightforward. Um, and then there, of course, the curmudgeon, which is I'm not going to use that HIE thing and I don't want to have anything to do with it. And I've, and I've never tempted to use it. Um, so the routine HIE user um, is really, you know, if the patient shows up in the ED or in clinic and says, I've been elsewhere, right? When they do that initial discussion with the patient, then that triggers the clinician to go and use the HIE to look up information, all right? So here's a quote from one of the uh, ED providers that we interviewed. Um, so that tells them that they should go and look at CareWeb, right? Because they've been, they know the person's been at an outside facility. The detective um, is one that, this person is always systematically seeking to get as much information as possible about their patient. So this is another quote uh, from, but this time from a, a primary care physician in the VA that says, well, I'm going to do, got to do a lot of legwork to find the information, right? So um, this person doesn't necessarily use the HIE, but they'll go to Google, they'll find that hospital, they'll find out who the medical records department, and then they'll contact them for the, to get the information. Right. Um, and or send faxes. So they're but they're going to try multiple methods to get to the information um, without just sort of, you know, kind of throwing their hands up after the first attempt. Then there's one that I call the preacher. Um, and this is one that says, you know what? Electronic, the HIE is not is is not the way to go. 
patients have to be the vehicle for communication of their own records. So I'm going to instruct all my patients, it's your responsibility to make sure you get copies of your radiology results before you walk out of the hospital and you get that, you bring me that CD-ROM and or DVD now. Um, and then you bring me a USB with your records on it or copies of all the paper charts from the other facility. It's your job to gather all, all that information and then bring it to me when you come in for follow-up care. And, and sort of coaching them on the mechanisms to, to do that sort of thing. Um, so that's one, uh, that's a, another common one that I see, or I, I think uh, that, that has emerged. This one I call the once bitten clinician. So this is the cl this is the clinician who tried to use the HIE in the past um, and had trouble using it for whatever reason. And so they've just given up on it. So now they're not going to use the HIE. They're not going back to CareWeb to try that thing again. Instead, they're going to resort back to faxing um, because that works well. And we still have a ton of fax machines um, around that they can use. So that's what they're going to use as their primary method of obtaining outside information. All right, so think about those terms or other, or other archetypes you might think of um, for the discussion part. The other thing that I wanted to present to you is a future study idea, something that I'm, I'm going to be working on developing a proposal and submitting uh, later this year. So some of you are familiar with the HRQ RFA that came out around care coordination. They're interested in studying uh, or in funding studies that look more at care coordination. Ostensibly, that's what our work has been about, both in the VA and at the ED, is understanding how information exchange can be used to facilitate coordination of care. Again, going back to that picture from Clem of the patient traversing this uh, complex network of facilities. So what I'm thinking is that we would uh, focus on the primary care setting. I think that is something HRQ likes as a focus in the studies that come to it. Um, and we would recruit and train some primary care practices to receive these alerts for patients who go, quote, out of network, right? So you can imagine if you're working in an IU health clinic that your patients, though, might end up at the community ED or they might get, uh, you know, admitted to Hendricks Regional Health uh, if you're like at IU West, for example, uh, and then you're responsible, right, for coordinating care after the discharge. Um, from our interviews, it's very clear that primary care physicians don't hear from ED physicians, and ED physicians don't really hear from primary care, right? There doesn't seem to be a lot of coordination there. Um, so we would target patients who, uh, who have ambulatory sensitive conditions that might need some more monitoring and would potentially benefit the most in terms of reducing Reducing rehospitalizations or additional, you know, costly uh, follow-up uh, care if it's go if it goes unmonitored, unfollowed up by the primary care system, um, and so we would uh, re recruit the practices implement this, um, maybe in, say, a stepwise fashion, uh, potentially, and then we would evaluate its impact on our outcomes, which would be uh, lower readmissions um, and uh, improved workflow, uh, potentially in coordination, and maybe uh, uh, trying to achieve a sustainable model that we could scale uh, across not only Indianapolis, but the rest of the healthcare system. We would also, one of the things that came out from uh, my interviews is that uh, clinicians like the alerts that we are sending them uh, in the VA, but they want the discharge summary to be attached. So that's one thing uh, that I'd like to make sure gets incorporated into the future work is that they not only get the alert, but they get some details about that visit without necessarily having to go and uh, search in CareWeb or the VA's portal or wherever. I know Titus, you've seen a lot of that uh, work yourself where clinicians want things to be a little easier to do rather than always going into CareWeb and searching for what you need. All right, so, to, so we have time left. I want to acknowledge I have some great teams both at the VA and here at Regan Streif um, that I'm working with, including the folks that you see listed at the bottom. Um, and with that, I will stop and I would love to hear back from you. Thank you. Hey, Alyssa. A very nice presentation. Um, so on a related note, I'm part of a 
IR at the VA looking at HIE and inpatient and outpatient care at four different VAs. So as you're going through the archetypes, we I was on the qualitative team for that. So we saw some similar findings. We didn't classify them that way, but maybe you and I could chat and see if there might be a way to combine that data if we wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was just a thought. And I'm also doing some work on care coordination and would enjoy chatting with you sometime afterwards about that. So thank you. Yep, let's do that. No, no other thoughts. Are you just in a postprandial uh, like coma now? Yeah. All right. I can see the wheels are turning. No, I mean I like the thought of <clears throat> archetypes to make it more memorable for people. It seems like a couple of them are related. So the person who um, uh, preaches to the patient is essentially delegating to someone else. So the delegator in the Mm. first group is offloading it on the healthcare team and the other is offloading it on the patient. Um, The second has no cost to the healthcare system, essentially. The other still has a time cost and a burden to the healthcare system, except the clinician in both cases is saying, I don't have time to do the work myself, but they're related. I think it's okay to keep them uh, separate. The other one that's related is the um, curmudgeon and the one spit clinician. The difference is the one spit clinician tries it once or twice and doesn't have preset notions and has just had a bad experience. You know, So if we can make the experience better, for that group, the curmudgeon, maybe people just set in their ways, you know, and they just have to retire or die away, you know. So, um, but uh, but I do think they're related because they're both um, not going to use the system. One because of a bad experience, and that I think is malleable. It might even help the curmudgeons if we make it more user friendly because mm-hmm. most IHI systems have just not been user-friendly. And when you developed one for PDMP, they took it away from you. You know, somebody else did. But uh, so, um, but anyway, those are just some thoughts. Yeah, no, thanks, Kurt. Good, good points. I, uh, I don't remember all the archetypes, but do you know, was there one that is kind of the the inverse of the once bitten where they were once the curmudgeon and somehow became persuaded to mm. try it and then were born again or uh, the, uh, you know, now uh, 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 an ardent user. Um, and I don't know how you would ident- identify yeah. them from the common users without delving into their past somewhat, but it to seems the like past, yeah, the, you exactly. know, some people got yeah. on, turned away and other people for some, they had some great experience and now they're a full supporter as a potential other archetype. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Yeah. I haven't seen that from, again, we didn't necessarily ask them about their history of, of using it per se to, to that level. Um, some, some of them obviously voluntold or volunteered that they had used it in, in the past and now didn't. Uh, but it wasn't a specific question, like probing question that we asked them. But, uh, but that's a good point is that, so, yeah, some of our routine users now may have been uh, curmudgeons in the past. Yeah. And maybe what, you know, kind of move them in, in that direction. I think Kurt's point is well taken, which is that, you know, user friendly. I, some of the, some of them did say, you know, I used to have to log into this thing and then search for the patient and then pull up the chart and the single sign on thing is a lot more convenient for me. So they like it a little bit better now. Um, so I, to his point, making it a little easier for them to find information um, is a good thing and can and can facilitate uh, usage, I think. Yeah. Details. So, as an avid HIE user, um, one of the things that I one of the things that's important is that people recognize that patients like it. I don't think that's mm-hmm. you don't always um, see that or know that. Uh, I have lots of new patients that come to see me, and they're 
surprised by the fact that I know what happened at St. Vincent, that happened at Princeton, that happened in these areas. The other thing that I noticed, I think we have to show is that the HIE makes it available times to see studies that are hard to see even within. So like I have trouble seeing sleep studies within Epic and I actually go to IHI to see the sleep studies. Um, and you know, even within Epic and seeing care everywhere, it doesn't pull in some of the media, the stuff that gets scanned in. So I think it's kind of trying to get the messaging that there is data there, but again, it goes to that usability, which mm -hmm. is funky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good points. Thanks, Brian. Brian, I'll just um, mention one other thing. So the, the focus appropriately because of how we use this is on, you know, clinician users. Um, can you say a little bit about what you see evolving or what we should be thinking about with regard to, you know, uh, non-clinician, just, you know, person users or, you know, I, I was going to say patient. I suppose it's patients because they're, it's their health data, but yeah, your thoughts on that. Yeah. So, um, I, I think it's, um, so I have a number of thoughts on that. So one is it, it's probably high time. We, we dive more into taking up the charge of getting patients access to the HIE. Uh, we tried, a decade ago, um, it, healthcare executives were not having it. Um, maybe time now to revisit that, um, especially if you know we are going to have you know some proportion of clinicians who think that they that that patients should be in charge of gathering the data. Then we need to give them tools to gather that data and aggregate it. Uh, the other thing is is that. Um, you know, there's a, there's, we did interview uh, one person in the ED. We came across a person who uh, works uh, at, at a hospital that has a helicopter service. And, you know, the, they were, they were envious of the fact that the uh, EMS drivers at Eskenazi can access uh, care web, but they cannot. Uh, and so, you know, we also need to think about what are kind of the um, ancillary care providers uh, that probably need access in, a, in, in either pre-hospital setting in that particular use case uh, or other use cases where it could be convenient. Um, you know, why, if we're going to try to, you know, refer patients to a social worker for social determinants, um, why shouldn't the social worker have access? access to IMPC, you know, uh, there, uh, one of our interviewees said that, uh, she had to fight, uh, to get access to it. Uh, she's like, look, all these physicians around me had access to it and I did not. And they were asking me to find all this information. Why can't I have access to it? So I think there's, uh, if we want to see usage increase and people actually maybe turning to IMPC for, uh, data to support, uh, detective work, uh, maybe we should explore more uh, folks on the care team um, or around the care team that could benefit from having access. Very good point. All right. Am I at time now? That, that clock says yes, but I don't know if it's off. Okay. Thank you.